I first made the decision to stop to stop hiding God from my political discourse. Mm-hmm. And how did that go? <laughs> I mean, I was really happy to do it, but the response was, uh-huh. I mean, worse than anything that I've, I've that really right? faced before. Yeah. Usually you find out that when people get really angry about something, they start using arguments as to why you're wrong that are very personal and not necessarily convincing. The hatred that followed from me voicing my political opinions or voicing my religious beliefs, they were oftentimes non-substantial right they were Mm -hmm. personal that then points me towards the idea well then if you don't have a good argument against what i'm saying then i might be on the right track oh yeah we just had a just a horrible story again of a young guy 25 year old dutch farmer who who committed suicide just two weeks ago oh yeah that's brutal he couldn't take it anymore and the suicide rates amongst farmers in holland are exceptionally high yeah compared to any well, other they're pushing group. them they're pushing them so hard so yeah if you're asking me if i'm waging a war well if, yes and it's it's a bloody one now hi Eva. hi Terry. <laughs> good to see you <laughs> good to see you too so mm-hmm. nice to see you again in person yeah really 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 nice and thank you so much for coming mm. here because and well i came a long ways as well Yeah, but it's all good, eh? All right. I mean, I had a forty-five minute flight. Oh, is that right? As that's long not as you very can, far. No, as long as you can still fly, it's not that far. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. As long as you can still fly. Yeah. So, for my listeners, tell us them who you are, what you've been doing, how long you've been at it. Okay. Okay. Just yeah. get them started. That's okay. always the simple question. That's actually hard to answer, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, Yeah. Who do you think you are? <laughs> no. yeah. um, so let's just keep it simple. I'm, I'm Eva Vleidingerbroek. So I'm Dutch. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, 26 years old. I do political commentary. Um, some might say I'm an activist, which I wouldn't necessarily disagree with. Mm-hmm. So I'm fine with bearing that title. Uh, I have a background in law. So I studied law. I, uh, I even started a PhD that I never finished due to a lot of reasons. Um, but so that's my background, legal philosophy. And uh, I try to incorporate that in my political commentary as much as I can to well, unravel all of the weird things that we're dealing with nowadays with the government and the relationship of the government to the people. And um, yeah, so I've been at this for a while because it started out, I started out with my political commentary by chance really in university because I was uh, not so happy with the uh, left-wing hegemony of the of the universities nowadays. And Mm -hmm. um, I pretty naively sort of, you know, spoke out against that after I had had some clashes with my professors going back and forth. um, And and I figured, okay, well, if I'm facing this much backlash for just voicing a simple opinion in my first year of, of law, then what where is the whole concept of of academic freedom really what's where's that at where's where did that go so i was kind of disillusioned by the fact that it wasn't what i had hoped for really uh, Mm -hmm. my days in university and i spoke to somebody at a conference one time who was a journalist and who asked me oh do you want to maybe tell this story and i was like oh yeah sure i'll tell the story (laughs) and then uh we did an interview and from there from that moment on there was really no return it was a already one time you speak out against that and the response was huge uh, and what were you speaking out about well i was i gave a very specific example that um i i lived in one of my first years in during my my law uh, Mm -hmm. studies for your first weeks and this was a, a discussion i had had with a professor about whether it was a violation of a human of human rights to not want to hire somebody who doesn't want to shake a woman's hand um Because in this case, it was a story of a, a real, real story of a janitor who wanted a job mm-hmm. at a high school, but he didn't want to shake hands with women because he was an Orthodox mm-hmm. Muslim. Mm-hmm. And the school said, "Well, you also, as a janitor, have the responsibility to to welcome parents into the school when they when they come to mm-hmm. the premise. And if you only want to shake hands of the father but not of the mother, then that's a problem. So we can't hire you." And he oh. took that to court. Oh. So he said, I've been discriminated against on the basis of my religion, right. and that's a violation of my human rights. And um, I argued very, well, not even, I didn't even quite say what I really thought about it. I mm-hmm. just said, oh, well, if he doesn't fit the do- job description, then it's fair enough that the school doesn't want to hire him. Mm-hmm. My real thoughts were, well, if you don't want to acknowledge the presence of half of the population, then you shouldn't be hired anyway. I didn't even say that, but just saying 
he didn't fit the job description made my professor really angry and told me I should do a, a confirmation bias test, which this was in 2014, mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. kind of like Early. a completely new concept. Then? I was 18. No, yeah, right. Yeah. So just, you know, that was the first time that I sort of got into contact with people who push these types of woke ideas. And, and that was in uni. And for a professor of mine to say that to me, well, you are racist, you just don't know it, and you should take this test. Uh, that mm -hmm. shocked me. And, and telling this story to a journalist, that became, well, became quite a bit of a, a thing in Holland. And it was a bit of an uproar. And from that moment on, I was labeled as a far right extremist, basically. And, uh, and the pushback that came sort of drove me further into the willingness to fight. So against What it. gave you the courage, though, to continue on, do you think, at that point? Well, because some people would just stop. They, yeah, they would think, "Oh, wow! Like, there's a lot of trouble here. I'm not doing this anymore." Well, because I knew that what was what I was saying was true. So it it was wrong that this was the situation at universities mm -hmm. in our time. You know that you weren't able to voice your opinion, and this was not. Now looking back on it, I'm like that was not a hot take or anything. You right. know, not anymore at least. But at the time, it was, mm -hmm. and the pushback only pushed me further into thinking, okay, well, I apparently hit a nerve here, so then there must be truth to it, so then I must continue and not give up now in the face of sort of the adversity that followed from it. So I just carried on. Sounds like truth is important to you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> yeah. When we met, we met, uh, how long ago was that? A few months ago. A few months ago. In uh, Rotterdam? Yeah, not yeah, even a couple Rotterdam. weeks. Oh, yeah, right. We You're on the road so much. Weeks. Yeah, it's only a couple yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah. We had dinner together and you came to the lecture. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about the fact that you decided to become a Catholic not very long ago. And you were very excited about it. Yeah. Let's talk about that just for a minute anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I became a Catholic on the 23rd of April, which is... Oh, it's a month ago now. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Well, I um, so just for the, sort of the background story, yeah. I've been I've been raised a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a Reformed Protestant, mm -hmm. and uh, my father was a Reformed Protestant. My father and I converted to Catholicism together, mm -hmm. which I'm just overjoyed by. Mm -hmm. uh, and my mother is a Catholic. Okay. And uh, my mother and my father both, you know, they, they raised me Christian. I mm -hmm. would definitely say that. But it mm -hmm. wasn't something that was really central, I don't think, in my education or even in my upbringing. I don't remember my parents ever pushing me or we, for example, we didn't read the Bible mm -hmm. on a daily basis. We never really prayed before dinner or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so all of the typical things that I saw around me from kids who grew up Christian who did do that. We didn't do that. So, but we did go to church. Um, we went to a Protestant church for the majority of my childhood mm -hmm. and I was baptized a Protestant. Mm -hmm. And then I remember when I was a young teenager around the age of, I think, 13 or so, that suddenly my dad and my mom had decided that we would go to my mother's church instead. So, um, Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I didn't really quite know why at the time, but now I did know. My, my parents told me, well, the Protestant church that we went to became so overly politicized. I see. It was so um, woke. Mm -hmm. It's not the word they would have used then, but mm -hmm. the word that they would use now. Mm -hmm. They said that it felt more like they were going to a political lecture rather than going to church and hearing the word of Christ. And so that pushed my Protestant father <laughs> to go to a Catholic church where that was not so much the case. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, they never, my father also never went back. So he's been mm -hmm. going to mass for, well, over 10 years now. And I went along, but I was a typical teenager, you know, at a certain age. I, I don't think I really quite understood it. Mm -hmm. I never... I never rejected my faith. Mm -hmm. I have never had a moment where I thought, well, this is all nonsense. I don't believe this anymore. Or mm -hmm. Rejected God. Mm -hmm. That never happened. But I definitely neglected it. Right. So it was not, my faith didn't play a central role in my life at all. And mm -hmm. that got worse, I think, throughout university. So the first couple of years. What do you mean got worse? Well, how, how could you tell? Like I felt like I drifted further away because I didn't live with my parents anymore. Mm -hmm. So even the incentive to go to church completely sort of disappeared. 
mm. because you know when I was younger, living in my parents' house, I would still go with them from time to time, or at least right. you know once a month or so. And then when you once you live on your own and nobody's like, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Mm-hmm. And you're just partying and you're a student. You you know I drifted further away from it personally, mm-hmm. and um, that didn't sit well with me. The, over the last, I think, two years or so. Because I, I noticed that in my political career and talking a lot about the truth mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. fighting against forces that I would definitely describe as evil, mm-hmm. I didn't describe them as evil then. I would have maybe said, well, confused people or people I disagree with. And, um, you know, that's easy when you talk about certain in a culture war and values, you could say not everybody who argues something different from what I say is evil. You know, actually, I think that's probably a good thing to not immediately label everyone you disagree with as, as evil. Mm-hmm. Um, but throughout the COVID pandemic, um, pandemic, mm-hmm. I would say now, yeah, uh, that shifted for me. So I felt like I saw true evil unfolding in front of our eyes on a very, very large scale from people that I've ne- I would have never expected to to be okay with that or to to do those types of things. Like, you know, not social exclusion, like canceling somebody for their political views, but real, legal, you know, actual societal exclusion where, okay, you don't do what I say. Well, you're a horrible person. You're irresponsible. You can't go here. You can't go there. And right. the growing feeling of not being free anymore, just basically from one year to the next was just like, oh, where is this going? Mm-hmm. And that sort of like launched me back into the questions of morality and where does morality come from and what's my source for the truth that I claim to be fighting for. Right. And that brought me back to my faith. And I started to engage in that more and more. I started to read the Bible again, Mm -hmm. which is a very different experience when you're an adult. Mm -hmm. And surrounding myself with more people who were saying the same things also and who all pointed back to God. Mm -hmm. And I had sort of chosen not to make the decision to say, oh, I'm either a Protestant or a Catholic. And I would kind of cherry pick. I'd be like, oh, my mom's a Catholic if you right. met Catholics. And uh-huh. I would be, oh, I'm a Protestant if I met Protestants. Mm-hmm. And, and that, you know, it's not wrong, wrong, but it was, I knew that for somebody who's so opinionated about most things, which mm-hmm. I am in mm-hmm. my life, then why would I cherry pick on the most important one? Let's make a well, you know, thought through decision about where I stand Mm -hmm. and um I made I first made the decision to stop to stop hiding God from my political discourse so to really start referring to my faith Mm -hmm. when I was doing commentary Mm -hmm. and how did that go (laughs) Hmm? I mean I was really happy to do it but (laughs) the response was Uh I mean worse than anything that I've I've really faced before in what way give me an example oh people can get get so mad and and mm-hmm. not just you know the people that I would use that I used to expect it from like you know really secular uh, leftists for example but yeah. even on my side you know on the conservative side uh, there would be a lot of people who said that's really stupid like, really you, yeah because they would say you should leave God out of it you should just argue from mm-hmm. a secular mm-hmm. perspective get to the morality of things without God because you're yeah. going to yeah. you're going to scare off the youth you're going to scare off the majority of your of your mm-hmm. um, of your audience and I was like okay well if that's the case then I should do it you know <laughs> so I did it and and but the response just it's yeah it's almost as if it, has there been a divided response or has it been a negative response or a positive response and the, i would say the majority of the people that especially in in the netherlands which is such a secular country yeah. so it's i think it's important for maybe you know on the other side of the atlantic in canada probably a different story but america it's really it's almost i would say almost fashionable for conservatives to include god in their in their political narrative mm-hmm. but that's not the case here i see it's like if you, in, in my country, if you start bringing God into things, even if you just say the most basic thing, mm-hmm. like I, Christ is my Lord and Savior, just right. that simple sentence, yeah. which if you don't believe that, I don't think you can even qualify as a Christian. Just saying something like that, it's like, oh, you're a religious fundamentalist, like she's gone crazy, she believes in fairy tales. Um, and, and I was just like, wow, the response here is so harsh, you know, so incredibly... I mean, yeah, mostly negative. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And 
again, that was something that I was used to, you know, the more the more negative the response was from the majority, the more I thought, well, then there must be some truth to it. Right, 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 right. And I, I lived that as a student already. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I figured, okay, mm. this is not going to stop me. And that strengthened me in in really looking for the truth. And I, and I found him in, in Jesus. I find it Jesus. quite remarkable, your conviction to have a response that's negative and to see that as an impetus to go forward with it. You know, that's that's great conviction. And I'm wondering where that came from. Mm, well, Do you I know? I spoke to your husband about this a little oh, bit. Oh, okay. Um, on the podcast that we did about the Dutch farmers. Oh, I didn't I didn't uh, get to that part of it. No worries. It was at the, <laughs> all the way at the end oh. also, just for the Daily Wire subscribers. So oh, I see. I, I mean, I don't blame you. That You would have been watching for three hours. So <laughs> don't worry. Um but we, you know, from a from maybe even a psychological perspective, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people in this industry who are, you know, huge fighters, warriors, yeah. who when you talk to them there and they talk about their childhood, they're like, oh, I've always been rebellious. Right. You know, like mm -hmm. I've always uh, questioned authority. Like m one of my my best friend, for example, she is a fighter and she... She, she always said, oh, I drove my parents crazy. You know, I never respected my teachers. I questioned everybody in a suit, everybody in a position of authority. And I was the complete opposite of that. Mm. I was a nervous teenager who I think the way I was raised by my parents naturally accepted hierarchies and accepted authority mm. because I was told, well, there is a reason for that. You know, right. it doesn't mean you should follow everything that everybody says, but your teachers are wiser and older than you. You might want to listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the police, you know, they're here to serve you. Mm -hmm. If they tell you something, you listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, just that natural sort of um, respect for authority, that's something mm -hmm. that I've been raised with and that I always held very dear. Mm -hmm. And so that's not where it comes from. So I was, you know, I was. Not, this is not something that I do because I think it's fun or it gives me a thrill or it excites right, me. Right, right, right. You're it, not looking for, you're not... It, looking for a fight exactly you just think oh this is interesting yeah yeah because then usually you find out that when people get really angry about something they start using arguments as to why you're wrong that are very personal and not necessarily convincing right so that just that simple the hatred that followed from m me voicing my political opinions or voicing my religious beliefs you know they were always they were oftentimes non-substantial right they were mm -hmm. personal mm -hmm. or they were you know right out insulting or harmful um and that then points me towards the idea well then if you don't have a good argument against what i'm saying then i might be on the right track uh -huh, right. and that pushes me towards going I, mm -hmm. I guess yeah the continuing on with it and now i mean now it's a i think it's a bit different because i'm not as nervous anymore mm-hmm because I've I feel like I've seen quite a lot um, throughout these couple these past couple of years, and mm -hmm. I know that a lot of doors are closed for me, but I don't mind that. So now I've chosen, and now I'm like, well, let's bring it on. You know, like, I, what are you going to try? You're going to call me a racist, a Nazi, a white supremacist, a shield maiden of the far right? You know, I've heard it all before, and mm -hmm. it doesn't phase me anymore. Mm -hmm. So now it's just game on. You know, ready for battle. So. <laughs> Have yeah. you had any battles recently? Oh, I'm always fighting. <laughs> Are you always fighting? Always fighting. But do you mean political ones or personal? Well, ones? I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, in the uh, in the Netherlands. Oh, with yeah. the farmers. Is yeah. that still going on? Yeah, that's still going on. That's they right. won, right? The well, the party that maybe was going to be helpful to the farmers won. Have they been helpful at all? Well, they, are you starting to see that? They haven't really officially had the chance yet okay. because the elections were just a couple of weeks ago and they still have to be... A couple of weeks ago. I've, I'm moving so fast. It yeah. seems like months ago to me. I can imagine. You okay, with okay. okay. a couple leading. of weeks ago. Yeah, so yeah. they haven't really had the chance yet, but mm -hmm. the, I don't know if it's going to make all that much of a change because eventually these elections were just... They were important because they were important for the Senate, but yeah. our government is still in power. I see. And so they're able to push through with a lot of the things that they want to do legally because they don't need new laws for that. Maybe if they want to expropriate the farmers eventually, mm -hmm. they will need to pass new laws. But now what they're doing, they've taken a very smart, different route, mm -hmm. and that's to offer bribes. 
So they make it incredibly difficult for farmers to get, for example, their license renewed. Mm -hmm. They can constantly subject them to new rules, new regulations, new... What kind of license do they need? Like farming licenses, basically, to oh, okay. emit, for example, nitrogen uh, oxide or right. to even have the land or something like that. And they, what they do is they make your life so incredibly hard mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's almost impossible. Anybody in their right mind would want to stop farming with how difficult things have become there's no money in it really unless right, you right. are a giga farm you know right. like a mega one yeah but for the regular dutch farmer it's it's not it's things are tight mm -hmm. you're constantly harassed by the government you've probably already been harassed for the past 15 years or so yeah it's getting worse and worse and they tell you well you might be expropriated at some point as well and then what they're doing now with the help of brussels is offer farmers 120 percent of the market value of their farms i see And they're hoping that most of them will just go and take it because they don't really see a light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, something that I kind of understand if you were right. to do it now. Right, right, right. And um, oh yeah, we just had a, just a horrible story again of a young guy, 25-year-old Dutch farmer who, who committed suicide just two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, that's brutal. He couldn't take it anymore. And the suicide rates amongst farmers in Holland are exceptionally high yeah. compared to any well, other Well, they're pushing group. them. They're pushing them so hard. Oh, well, if you know, if you ask me in, in terms of the fight, you know, to me, this is the doing of our government. So these people have blood on their hands. Yeah, right. And that's what I'll say. You know, obviously, this young man took his own life. Yes. But he was pushed to take 25. his own life. How dare they? It's it's horrible. Yeah. And nobody really talks about it. You know, if we have a we have a Dutch politician, Sigrid Kaag, she's our uh, vice uh, prime minister. If she gets harassed, you know, on the internet, then everybody speaks out about it. Like, oh, it's the most horrible thing in the world. It's if people are, it's, you know, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. misogyny. And she was on TV just the other day and she cried because her daughter said that they feared for her life. And the whole country is up in arms. So we can't yeah. have this happen in democracy. Oh, this is a, you know, yeah. this is a liberal democracy. We can't have people be uh, harassed like that. Whereas, you know, that's obviously, I'm not saying that that's right. But comparing that to what our government is doing to thousands of people, these farmers, you know, like really actively destroying their lives, their livelihood, pushing them to commit suicide because yeah. they're so desperate. And that doesn't get any airtime. Mm -hmm. That People are not interested in those lives. And just the unfairness of that, you know, of the establishment not caring whatsoever about, you know, the deplorables of this world. And those are the deplorables that bring your food to the table, but you just completely seem to forget that. Right. That just, you know, it makes my blood boil. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're asking me if I'm if I'm waging a war, well, yes. And it's it's a bloody one now. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so that's... What was the name of this young fellow who died? Roland Hamming. Yeah. 25. Yeah. His father, Gerrit, found him in the barn. Oh. In the stables. Oh dear. And yeah, like I said, he's not the only one. Was this the family farm? This yeah, yeah the dairy farm. farmers. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, if that's not worth fighting for, then I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what is. That's right. Yes, you know, when you see something like that, it's a canary in the coal mine. That, and the farmers are in the Netherlands have been a canary in the coal mine. And now we're seeing that individually. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yikes. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, I don't know if you wanted to get back to the No, to the I just want to talk about one more thing. Yeah. What do you think the Chinese have to do with this? What's going on in the Netherlands? Oh. Do you have any ideas of what's how, I don't, how they're I don't involved know. or if they're involved? I don't know what the role of the Chinese government is specifically with the farmers. You know, it's, it's it's difficult. I find it difficult in general to answer that question when it comes, for example, to climate change policies. Yeah. Because I, I meet people who say, well, this is all just, you know, a, a agenda pushed by the China China's Communist Party. Right. Blaming the, them in particular. Yeah. To, yeah. to, to, to destabilize the West in general through yeah. the narrative of climate change. Mm -hmm. And I think there's definitely some truth to that. But I think it's also a mistake to just look at the Chinese yeah. because our government's doing the exact same thing. Western liberal elite powers are pushing the exact same narrative. Yeah, they picked, they picked if, if, it, if it has come from China, they've picked that up and run with it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So then it's it's to me it's almost like a chicken or egg type of situation. It's do the people in power in the West do are they in you know in the same boat? Are they in bed with the Chinese or are they just useful idiots who run with a narrative that the Chinese use to to destabilize the West? Is it both? You know. Mm-hmm. And I wonder what what makes the West vulnerable to that message. And I think it's a lack of faith. Yes, which I completely agree with. I think it's been the same with COVID because it's a lack of faith and it plays onto our fear of death or into our fear of death. Mm. Same thing with COVID. Climate change and COVID were in that sense are similar means, but climate change is probably even more effective than COVID. Right. In the sense that it installs fear that our life is going to end. You know, with COVID, you could die from a virus. Mm-hmm. And soon enough, we saw, well, you know, only old people die from it or yeah. people who are, you know. Even, even you know, recently I heard, uh, I don't know the statistic, but that um, of all the people that they said yeah. died of COVID, there's, there's hardly any. Hardly any. Hardly any. There were usually, you know, three or four comorbidities yeah. that were causing the death and yeah. they never they Young, never, healthy people, very close to zero. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Miserable. So if it, you know, fear, but twisting it, twisting the truth to uh, make sure that there's a narrative that uh, they can stand behind to cause more fear. Yes. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. Very strange way. And like even you in, said, there's evil lurking. When you oh, don't yeah. understand it and it's weird, then you know that that's evil. Yeah, Seems. exactly. When you can't rationally explain it, yeah, you know, from from with with good morals in in, in you know in the back of your mind, you, with the farmers, same thing. If you think, well, you know, if the, if these people have good intentions, then why why can't they, you know, technological? Can't they accept technological advancements for the farmers right. to reduce nitrogen oxide? If they right. really think that it's a problem, why wouldn't they allow that? And the answer is always no. And there's never a good there's never a good explanation as to why they don't accept these types of arguments why it always comes down to them disappearing and the government taking the land you know yeah, yeah. then if you try to argue if you try to explain that to yourself and you, you, you can't succeed it's mm-hmm. just weird and it doesn't mm-hmm. make sense oh yeah it's then very, usually very interesting. there's just bad intent and that's where you find evil i think so i think you're yeah. right well did, did you ever see the movie um the death of stalin no i didn't oh you have to watch that because uh it's humorous, right? Mm. It's hum- but it's very, very dark humor because it's all about the death of Stalin. So it's the whole, uh, um, ev- everybody, you know, uh, is all the death of Stalin. Oh, my God. And like, how are we going to talk about this? How are we going to talk about this? Mm. You know, are, how are we going to give this to the people? You know, and, how, and so they're, they're spinning yarns. And, but it's all very dark because these are people who are dying and people who are being killed. And they're making very dark jokes about it. And I've been talking to Jordan about that. And he said, you know, I think that this movie, the way they portrayed communism was the way it was. So, you know, things are happening and you're scratching your head and you're thinking, that's odd. You know, it's that, that's kind of weird how that's going. That, maybe that's evil. Hmm. You know, it isn't always obviously dark so that you can recognize it. Right. Yeah, right. So it comes about in these, so all this stuff that's happening, we're going, why, you know, why are the, why is the EU... Yeah, confusion. Drumming on, yeah. Maybe it's confusion. It's confusion, you know, yeah. God is not the author of confusion. No. So then who is the author of confusion? Right. Well, that's the devil. Yeah, yeah. And confusion is maybe worse than evil in plain sight. Right, because then you can recognize it. Right. And you can identify it. You can point at it. But this you can't point at. Yes. You can kind of point at it, but it moves around and... There's, there's this, different players, there's different narratives. Yeah, you don't yeah. know exactly who you're fighting. There's this wonderful... Yeah, very interesting. ...wonderful quote that I used one time in this speech I gave that was called Embrace God, Reject Globalism. Uh-huh. And the quote goes something like, the greatest trick that the devil has ever pulled is to convince the world that he doesn't exist. Uh-huh. And I think right. that's very true. And I think the totalitarian spirits of today or the people that we're dealing with today mm-hmm. have understood that very well. 
So you're pushing horrible, evil policies that ruin people's lives, but you do it under the guise of a greater good, such as protecting the climate. Uh, but I think they got there little by little, mm. right? So I think that when they were young, they learned maybe maybe their parents weren't paying attention to them, and so they learned to get attention through lying, through through making themselves more. Uh, bigger than they were or more important than they were or sweeter than they were or whatever it was but it's still a lie you know yeah and so li a little baby lie and then as they grow up then they can use those types of manipulations with their relationships and by the time they become a professional they're good at that mm. they're good and that's who they are because they've forgotten that little girl in the beginning who was sweet and with God at the beginning. And I know that's true because my grandchildren, when I sit with them and I pray the rosary, they are completely uh, consumed by it. There's no uh, resistance. There's no resistance. It's true. I can see that they can tell it's true. Hmm. And it's beautiful. And that's why you have to come to Christ as a child. Yeah, is because you need that uh, total uh, acceptance in order to really accept Christ in your life, right? And so children do that. But when they don't, when they start on this voyage of deception, mm. which which is a an evil, it's an evil choice. Yeah. I mean, you're either choosing good or you're choosing evil. Evil. Yeah. Right. So if you're not choosing good, it's evil. evil. It doesn't matter what it looks like. If it's funny or agreed. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's how it happens. And I, because we've left the, and not just religion, but the practice of prayer, the practice of belief, right. the practice of living in truth. Because we've left that, we've left that in ourselves. Then we're open to. The deception and it's everywhere oh yeah yeah there is no middle ground between good and evil no there isn't there like isn't. you think you're, there might be you think there might be because you know it kind of doesn't seem so bad right <laughs> i always think that people say like oh you know the world's not black and white that's that's i mean that's true that the world isn't black and white your experiences can be all sorts of things but when it comes to the truth good and evil that is black and white and then saying, oh, everything is gray and there is no white, there is no black and, you know, there is no mm -hmm. truth, but there's mm -hmm. just your truth. There's my truth. Right, 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 there's, right. That is, that, those to me sound like the world of, of the devil now. Yeah, you know, right, when right, I hear right. that, when I hear people say, oh, but I have my truth and you have your truth. Right, right. There's nothing <laughs> more dangerous to me than that. Yeah, because that's not communication. No, and that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's really, really dangerous. Because if you want, I, this is what I've been talking about recently. So if you communicate with someone and you get to a point where you're at an understanding, mm. then play emerges. Yeah. And that play is good. Right. And what's good? Well, that's truth. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you're back to God again. So if you're, so if you're not, if you're saying my truth, your truth, there's no communication there. No, that means there's no play. There's no negotiation. Right. There's no place of dance. Right. Yeah. 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 And you can't get anywhere because it's just, you know, why even bother? Right. If you have your truth and I have my truth. Yeah. You might as well each go a separate way. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And the result of that's not good. <laughs> Results of that is not good. So I agree with you that the, the answer is always, to me also, in my political you know, endeavors, uh -huh. always comes back to the idea, well, without God, we're nowhere. You know, and you can argue certain things from a secular perspective, of course. Of course you can. And there are people who do it wonderfully and there are wonderful people who don't believe in God. But the, the fundament's missing. And so then it's almost like you build a really beautiful house on a foundation that or on no foundation so it might be really beautiful it might be well constructed it might stand there for a little bit but it's not going to last and if if a tornado comes along in your life and tornadoes do come along yes or demons knock yeah. on your door then yeah. it's going to all come crashing down and what are you going to rebuild it on you know and and that fear of death that i think is being politicized mm -hmm. really smartly by certain globalists right now that wouldn't work if people aren't so deadly afraid of the afterlife. 
if they realize that there is more to life than just this physical realm that we are in right now, than the material world. Well, I see that in, and I haven't uh, joined the Catholic Church yet. So I'm still on my way to joining a church. Like you said, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, well, I was born and baptized in the Protestant Church. Uh, I, I found out that my great grandmother was a Catholic, mm. and my grandmother changed our religion back to Protestantism. So I realized that I'm more of a Catholic than I thought I was. Right. And um, when I was very, very ill, one of my cousins sent me my grandmother's, my great grandmother's rosary. So I have my great grandmother's ah. rosary, and I prayed that the whole time I was sick. Oh, great. And uh, now people give me rosaries, so I have lots of them. I have, I have a collection of That's rosaries. That's how it started. I didn't know that. Yeah, because yeah. you told me you prayed the rosary, and I was I wanted to ask you how that came about, yeah. but this is how That's it came what, about. Well, one of my cousins found out I was ill, and she said, I'm going to send you something. Yeah. And I guess her, this rosary was willed to her, mm -hmm. and she and she sent it. That's beautiful. There's a, there's a twist to that, too, because I stopped to see her. I told her I was in town and it was only because flights are canceled and then flights are delayed and I ended up in the town that she lived. I phoned her. We made plans to have lunch the next day. She chose a vegetarian restaurant and I only eat meat. Yeah. So I said, you know, Jordan and I only eat meat. She said, oh, you're with Jordan? I said, yeah. She said, I don't want to see you. Mm -hmm. So although she sent me a rosary, she's been taken by the ideology that's, that's, you know, every time I hear a story like this, whether it's now yours or something similar, yeah. it pains me more when it comes from somebody who says that they are a follower of Jesus Christ yeah. or a Catholic. It's worse. Yeah. It's, yeah, like, it's, it's okay. awful. So then you really, do you, do you understand what you're about? Do you understand what your belief is about? Yeah. Would, would Christ himself have, have said something like that? Right. The immediate answer is no, of course not. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, herself. And the thing is, is this young woman who's more my age now, she and her sister, their mom and dad died when they were just getting married, so young, you know. And uh, so I wanted them to be open to ha being part of my family, which was still complete mm -hmm. my mom has now passed away but my father is 92 he's still alive and so there's mm -hmm. still some family there but that, that that hasn't happened you know so still not it's just uh it's sad it's sad to see but i i hope that um i'll find the courage and the strength to uh to pursue her mm -hmm. and her sister and to try to uh make steps in that direction. But I tell you that what's going on there, I can tell is not, uh, it's not good. No, so, no, no, that's... And that's just a microcosm of what's going on in the world. Yeah, and what I think is something that we see quite often coming from, especially from, the, or predominantly from the left, is that they don't honor family bonds. So I see that all the time that people will attack my parents, for example, on my, you know, the things that I say. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, you have to, you have to reject what your daughter says actively. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're a bad person, you know, like, oh, you might be okay. But if you have a daughter who says these types of evil things or is so, you know. Outspoken. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. you have to stand up against your daughter. You have to correct her. You have to reject her, her views. And just from... You know, I love my father and mm -hmm. my father and I are really close and I, my mother and I are really close. We have just, a, I'm very, mm -hmm. very blessed with the family structure that I've had mm -hmm. throughout my childhood. I think part of why you asked me why I had the courage to do that is because I always knew I had a safety net coming home. Always. Yeah. So that, I think that is the answer actually mm -hmm. to that question. I thought, I knew there was something like that there. Yeah, it's definitely that. Right. I knew that if I stood up for what I was thought was true, mm -hmm that even if the whole world rejected me, my parents wouldn't. Right. And, you know, and I and I know that God won't reject me either. So that's yeah. if I seek him. Yeah. So that is those two things, my, you know, my, my family here and my family in heaven is that's, that, those are the two things. Yeah. That and I and think I think for myself, and I'm, you know, like twice your age, right? Or even, yeah, twice your age, but um, when things happen, 
for me or if I put myself forward in a, in a brave way. And I know that's a, that's a relationship with my Heavenly Father that I have because that's the supportive social mm. impetus to, to be, to take steps forward when, when you might be afraid. But I recognize more and more as I get older where that began and it began with my father hmm. it began with my father and that has translated to a heavenly father as i've got older uh which is how i can carry on and and do things when when i think oh this is too much for me i you know i can't do this i can say okay you know i just need help i just need help and i can ask for help yeah you can pray yeah, yeah i can ask for help and i ask for help you know every night before i go on stage i ask for courage and strength before yeah. I go, I know those are the, the things that I uh, need help with when I'm trying to do something that seems beyond me. Hmm. And so, but fathers, I mean mothers and fathers, but fathers for some reason, the so the the uh, the adventure side of life. And you know, so many people now are raised without a father, hmm. and yeah. that that's another thing that is. Uh, starting to is playing out, but what it means remains to be seen. But it's playing out that people are being raised without a father, and um, yeah, in a society that doesn't reflect those patriarchal structures anymore either. Yeah. So then, that's yeah, that's that's really interesting. It is, isn't will, it interesting? Well, because I mean, you have a good father. You have a good father. And the other friend of yours that I was talking about just before we started, mm -hmm. she has a very close relationship with her father. Mm -hmm. She really admires her father. And she's tough. Yeah. You're right? She's she's willing to get out there and say things and, and butt, uh, butt her head up against things. Yeah. And she had a very strong relationship with her father. It's so funny. That's why I never, I think I never bought into the, the feminist narrative of the patriarchy uh -huh. being evil. Yeah, you wrote, like, a, you wrote, or you wrote, or you had a talk on yeah. feminism? Yes, that was kind of how my political, real political career sort of launched. That was the first time I was on stage ever. And that was in front of 3,000 people, which was wow, a lot. Yes. <laughs> and still, I, I would still kind of be a bit shaky, I think, if I were to go up on stage in front Where of 3,000 people. Where was that? Where again. did you do that? That was in... Um, I was in the middle of the country, and that was for a political uh, party that I was a part of back then. Oh, it right. didn't work for them yet, but I was sort of finding my way into mm -hmm. that party. Mm -hmm. And they had asked me if I wanted to be at that conference that was a big Congress, uh, like um, a member's day, basically, for the party. You mm -hmm. know, all the people mm -hmm. who were a member of the party could come, and mm -hmm. 3,000 people were coming, and they asked me if I wanted to be there and be kind of the host on stage, you know, to hold the microphone oh, yeah. and hand oh, it to yeah. everybody. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll hold the microphone, but I want to say something. <laughs> and they're like, okay. And sort of, I think, because it was such a young party, they, yeah. had, they had just been established. Uh -huh. Nobody was really paying attention to sort of, you know, how those things were. It's just somebody okay did. It was like, okay, you go. Yeah. But nobody followed up with me uh, about what I was saying. They were just like, what do you want to say? I was like, oh, I, I would like to say something about feminism. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> and then by the time, you know, the day arrived, somebody, I remember somebody going like, what, what is she talking about again? <laughs> Uh, feminism oh okay D did she get cleared uh, oh no you know and i just went on stage without anybody reading what i had to say uh -huh. so it could have been a disaster for the party really you know could yeah, have been, yeah. Like, could have gone on there and said all sorts of horrible things right 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 um but it wasn't a disaster because it was in line with what they believed oh, it was, uh? but it was i mean it caused a big storm mm -hmm. and i i think sort of the it was definitely you know criticism of modern day feminism how hypocritical feminists nowadays i think are but also it's just i it never resonated with me the idea that the patriarchy was an oppressive uh you know construct that was there to to hold women or to keep women down or things like that because i never experienced that in my life you no know? where do you think that comes from that idea that the patriarchy is there to uh to be oppressive and and uh and limit us and you know the the things that the the, narr the narrative that has been around now for a very long time, way too long. <laughs> well, I think it comes down to a more general ideology that I've often described as neo-Marxism, mm -hmm. which kind of 
again, is the idea that there is a structure against you. You know, so there is an oppressive idea that is against you, be it the patriarchy, be it, well, you know, any type of sort of institution, really. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And that I never believed. And I think, again, the question of faith and the Catholic doctrine on this Mm -hmm. is a perfect antidote to it, which is much healthier, which is the fact that we are all born with original sin. Right. And so, you know, you have free will to choose good and evil. Mm -hmm. You most likely will, you know, uh, fall towards evil a bit more often. And you have to work really hard to get to because it's easier. The arrow path, broad path, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but that's that's your responsibility. Mm-hmm. You have free will. You mm-hmm. have agency over your life. You are not a, you know, small victim to an evil structure that is outside of you, which is I think what the left always propagates. Yeah. You know, systemic racism, the patriarchy. Uh, now we can all be victims of you know big capital that produces climate change, which we will also come to if the world comes to an end. It's always something external. Mm-hmm. And we are inherently sort of good people who are corrupted. Kind of a Rousseauian idea, yes, right? Yes. I mm-hmm. think that's, with that guy, that's where it went wrong. <laughs> I really don't like that guy. No, you Which, don't have to like that guy. No, I really don't <laughs> like him. I think it's a very dangerous idea to say that we are born good and mm-hmm. that we are corrupted by society because then some people get to decide that certain structures which in, I think in our current time are very influenced, of course, by our historical perception also of the Second World War. So mm-hmm. our idea of what is evil, what the left you know, constantly pushes, is why do they call me, for example, or your husband or you, Nazis or far-right extremists? It's because that is the cultural perception of what is evil in our time. Mm-hmm. Patriarchal, heterosexual, white male, yeah. you know, and white woman, s- still bad. Yeah, you know, <laughs> still bad. You're, you're still binary, which is bad. Yeah. And so if that is evil and that is the corrupting force in society, but you are born good, then that that's basically what they, that's their whole worldview. And that... That's simple. Yeah. And yeah, that takes away just, any type of social... You just paint everything with that. Yeah. And any type of personal responsibility is then gone because yeah. you are always a victim. And that's, that's how I got back to the idea of neo-Marxism. It's dividing society in that way. So there's always a perpetrator and there's, there's a victim and... The perpetrator in this case is not, you know, the upper class necessarily versus the workers, but it's the white man versus any type of minority or woman or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the feminism thing goes back to that. Patriarchy goes back to that. But a lot of the other, I think, you know, left wing doctrines follow from that same idea, which doesn't happen when you believe that you are, although created in the image of your creator, you are not God, but you have to answer to him. You Mm -hmm. don't answer to the government, to climate change, to whomever, you know, whichever ideology is on earth, you right. answer to God, so you answer yeah. to the truth. Yeah. And you have to seek the truth. You have to find it. You mm-hmm. know, I'm not saying that we all know it, but you have to do no, your best. No, you have to ask. You have to ask, mm-hmm. and there is an authority that can give it to you that yeah. is the truth. Right. Which is much safer than the listening to the government. Yes. You know, or to any type of totalitarian force in this world. Mm-hmm. And... Original sin, which is now seen as something so backwards, you know, like, oh, that's an oppressive idea that you are that you are sinful. No, it basically just means that you are not perfect. You are not God and you will have a tendency towards evil things and you have to work hard to not do that. Yeah, well, sin, what does sin mean to miss the mark? So, yeah, you know, do you miss the mark? Yes. Well, then you sin. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, right? Yeah. And that's not heavy. That's actually very redeeming. And it's very democratic and it's very egalitarian because we all are sinners. Yes, that's and, right. And, and so then it makes it easy to talk to someone because yeah. they're no better than you are. No. Or any worse than you are because everybody right. is, is striving up that hill. Yes. And yeah. the judgment is not up to us. So, you know, it's not... Yes, and the judgment is not up to us. And that is completely misunderstood these oh, days. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, man, is judgment gone wild now? Yes. Well, in a way, it's gone wild. And in another way, we're all told that we're perfect the way we are. Yeah, right. right so right. it's the worst of both worlds. You know, the judgment is with the few who claim to have found the truth mm-hmm. or the science nowadays. Because right, that's the, science. the truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that can also be that men can be women and women can be men. So science according to us, you know? Yeah. Um, and we are the good people in society. And then the people who go against that are deplorables or are stupid or should be... Yeah, there's that's judgment. 
yeah, it's terrible be censored. Judgment. Yeah, even your opinion you can't voice, you mm-hmm. know, because that's misinformation or that's hateful speech or whatever. And and <laughs> but at the same time, we're all good the way we are. Yeah, it's deadly because mm-hmm. you don't stri- You can't strive for anything. No, if the norm is completely obli- like obliterated. Yeah, and the wonderful thing about uh, belief and being uh, true to the word of God is that then you have an authority. Hmm. And then you can, in any situation, you have that authority because it's with you all the time. Yeah. And everyone would be so much calmer. Oh, yeah. And so much less reactive. I think it's funny how it's... It's gone out of fashion. Yeah. And uh, it could come back into fashion if people would uh, just get down on their knees. Oh, that's... Becoming a Catholic, I think I told you, right? So for the confirmation uh-huh. on the 23rd, before you get confirmed and before you are received into the into the church and you receive your first Holy Communion, you have to um, go to confession. Uh. And as a Protestant, I had never gone to confession, no. obviously. So no, then you Protestants have... don't have to go to confession. No. Maybe that's where things start to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, I'm starting to think that more and more <laughs> because, boy, is it difficult to go and confess 26 years of sin, <laughs> you know? How long You're did like, you have to sit in there? <laughs> well, I, I immediately made that joke because I was talking to the priest and I said, well, how long do I have? Because I have 26 <laughs> years of sin to confess to you. And he was like, oh, you know, you can probably fit it into half an hour unless you committed murder or something. And I was like, oh, no, okay, I'm good. So it was it was funny, but, you know, yeah. you think about it, and you're like, gee, man, 26 years of sin, where yeah. do you start? Yeah. And yeah. so I really had to go sit down with a piece of paper and yeah. think about all the things that I think I did wrong. Mm-hmm. That's such and, a good exercise. And you don't get to sugarcoat it, you no. know? Because it's not, oh, I'm sitting in front of a therapist who um, is here to, to help me well, sometimes I feel like I've been talking to therapists. I'm sure your husband has a different approach, but <laughs> who, are, who I felt were there to make me feel better about the things that right, I did, you right, know, right. instead of really facing up to what uh-huh, I did. Uh-huh. And that's not that's not an option when you're going to confess your sins because no. you are confessing your sins to God. Mm-hmm. And there's no... God already knows what your sins are. He's in, he can hear you, you know, he can he hear your He already knows what they are. He's <laughs> just wondering if you know. <laughs> yeah, so then you also know, like, oh, I can't, like, take the short route here or I can't, like, you know, cut the edges or sugarcoat this because yeah. that is a That's sin. That's a lie. Of, That's a lie. That's, That's a, a sin lie. in and of itself. So yeah. you have to own up to what you've done. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I came out of that bawling my eyes out. Yeah. Not necessarily because maybe anybody else would have thought, oh, that those are, you know, I, I just for the record, I didn't kill anybody. Yeah. But just having to admit that quite literally on your bare knees because you're kneeling down and you're saying, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Yeah, and you're addressing you know, the Father. You stole five cents from your mother's purse and bought a candy. <laughs> but no, you never told anybody. <laughs> no. So now you got to tell God. Yeah. And you got to admit that to God off. that you did that. And mm-hmm. those things lift you yes. right they lift you and bring you closer yeah and that that redemption because well then the redemption follows obviously after a moment of judgment and yeah of course because there is a penance yeah you are you are asking for a forgiveness yeah you are showing true redemption that's the point mm-hmm. and you're facing the the punishment so there's accountability and those two things redemption and accountability are completely gone in our society yeah right it's just like oh no even with the you know with the covid pandemic oh, they're taking when they, things from stores Oh, yeah. and it's yeah. okay. It's okay because <laughs> you know it's social justice. What you know? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What are you talking about? That's or crazy with COVID. Yeah, we need p- uh, pandemic amnesty because well, we didn't know. You know, like what do you mean you didn't know? You you knew what right and wrong was, mm-hmm. or you you should have known. Mm-hmm. So even if you if you didn't know, then you shouldn't have excluded people on the basis of that, or you shouldn't maybe have gone through such far extents. In, 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 you know, harassing people and shaming them and, and doing and firing people from their jobs, etc. And, and if you want amnesty now, if you want forgiveness now, because that's what you're asking for, yeah. then you at least have to admit that you were wrong. And right. if you're saying, well, I just didn't know any better, that's not a real apology to me. You know, that's like a guy who cheats on his wife and then says, well, I'm sorry I got caught, you know? Yeah. like that's Oh, I didn't know that was wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah, that must have been easy to say that. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and with the... The confession of your sin, even though, you know, people laugh about it all the time, like, oh, you, you can buy off your sins or you can get indulgences, you you would have been able to. 
no, if you really take confession seriously and you sit down on your knees and you confess to God what you've done, that's mm -hmm. a very hard thing to do. And you have to own up to what you did. You have to take responsibility. You have to accept the penance. And then you can be redeemed for the acts that you've done. Yeah, that's right. But it doesn't come without those steps first. Right, right. Yeah. And, then, and so people wonder why they don't have any redemption. It's because they haven't actually admitted their sins yet. Like really admitted them. Yeah. Truthfully. Yeah. And that's not easy. That's no. not easy. And it has to be done every day. Yeah. I mean, you thought there was that one day where you did all 26 years. <laughs> yeah. But now there's all the days after and the years after. Yeah. And yeah. it's continual. And it, right? And it's continual. And that's what I like about, you know... The, also the jump that I've made to Catholicism and something that you, maybe you'll find because you, you said it earlier in our conversation, you have to do it on a, almost like, like a ritual. Like you have yes. to do it every day. You have to repeat things. And to me, you know, Protestants will often say yeah, that's what they don't like about Catholicism is the ritual or the idea that you have to follow certain steps and your relationship is only with Christ and that's it. Mm -hmm. But religion, relationship, having a relationship with your heavenly father why wouldn't you invest in that on a daily basis? Why wouldn't you try at least? And why is it bad that there is then an institution like the Catholic Church that helps you with those things? And mm -hmm. it's a bit of a, you know, we would say, um, in Dutch, we would say a stick behind the door. Probably doesn't translate well, but like a foot between the door maybe that mm -hmm. you have to, yeah, you, keep have, to, going. you have to keep going. You yeah. have to invest. And why is that a bad thing? Like we would expect it's that from our thing, you know? material relationships too, right? Yeah, with people. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, well, it's called perseverance. Yeah, and I can tell my dad that I love him and he will know for the rest of his life that I love him. But if I never call him on the phone or I never visit him or I never do anything to strengthen that relationship, then would he stop loving me? Probably not. But is that the right thing? No, you mm -hmm. know? So I try to view my relationship with Christ the same way and, and becoming a Catholic, just sort of making that commitment has really helped me. To, to think, okay, well, I'm going to take this really seriously, seriously now. Seriously, yeah. Yeah, well, what I've found, uh, although I haven't actually joined the church, I practice. I mm. practice daily prayer, daily uh, self-reflection to mm. see what I've done at the end of the day, to see what I've done through the day that I need to uh, admit and... Um, apologize for and make amends for right so sometimes at the end of the day if there's something if there's someone oh well if it's not too late i can call them mm. you know if it's not or or if it's too late maybe i can email them or or i can wait till tomorrow and say but it is actually very nice to be able to go to sleep at night having cleared the plate and people wonder why sometimes they can't sleep at night maybe it's because they have these un finished business yeah and then they carry that through the night well you're not going to have a good sleep and mm -hmm. then you have to get you're not going to be refreshed in the morning because of the things you have to face that were from the day before so yeah. it's a really nice practice to do that every day i was always so that's something that your husband said so often that always stuck with me that the idea that he saw in his practice is that people don't get away with anything uh-huh that was that was so powerful to me when i yeah. first heard him say that yeah it's like oh yeah that's true, because you really don't get away with anything, do you? No. I mean, with every single lie or well, thing. Well, that's because you haven't admitted it. Yeah. So it's not conscious. Right. Right? So as soon as, I think as soon as you make it conscious, then the next time you try to do it, you think, oh, I did this once before and it didn't work. Well, I'm not going to do that again. Right. Yeah. May I ask you, if you don't want to answer me, that's also, because I know that's it's okay. really personal. Like, what, what, what is holding you back from joining the church? Or I what think are the I've just been traveling to? too long. Okay, yeah. No, I get that. I get that. Because <laughs> I've, I've actually, we got a plaque the other day for how long we've been on the road. I've uh -huh. been on the road since January 22. <gasps> oh, <yeah. laughs> so it's been a long time. Yeah. I'm yeah. going home tomorrow. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. that's... Yeah. See? I'm going to go, I'm going to babysit my granddaughter the next day. Great. So, yeah, it's good. Okay. And so then, then I can start. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so. happy. That's good. <laughs> oh, I'm also happy with the response. And we're going to be home till January, so I have a number of months oh, that's... to get my house in order. Yeah. So it took me. I think my process was about seven months, eight months. Right. So yeah. you know, really, from deciding that I wanted to become a Catholic to actually becoming a Catholic. Yeah. So, I mean, no yeah. less even. 
Now that yeah. I'm thinking well, about it. Well, it seems... I fast-tracked it. <laughs> I think of, I think of uh, orthodoxy as a, an option, too. Hmm. Um, and I have some... I, I know some orthodox priests. I know some Catholic priests. Uh, but I know that there's Catholicism in my background. Mm-hmm. So that's, that seems to be where I should be. So anyway, I'll figure that all out in the next I'm sure you will. six months. I'm sure you will. I'm yeah. happy, though. That's, that's wonderful news. Yeah. No, it is. It's really good. It's, and even as far as I've gone now has been made a world of difference. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so I can't imagine how much difference it'll make when I finally get to the place that I need to to make a proper choice. But even just right now, just to have a practice of prayer, Mm-hmm. And a daily um, self-reflection to the day um, has made a world of difference. Uh, I feel lighter mm-hmm. I've, and uh, I feel like I'm facing the world more as a child, which is what you, yeah. is what they say you need to be. Childlike order, faith. Yeah, 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 is what you need to be. And so it's possible mm. if that's what you want. Yeah, but you have to decide: Are you willing to give up the uh, relationships that you have now that you've built on lies mm-hmm. and manipulation? You have to decide that. Yeah, because that will happen. Yeah, and and, and I've seen that happen because I thought I lost just about everyone that I could potentially lose over political issues. Mm-hmm. That's not that, that turned out to be true. You lose people every single time, and I now notice after converting to Catholicism, you lose people again. Oh yeah, people can't accept it. And uh, that's something that I've been quite even disappointed in also from, you know, my, I used to be a Protestant for my entire life. Right. And the response from a lot of Protestants has been so, so like upsetting. Oh, is they that were right? so angry. Oh, really? So angry, which I can't really understand because it all, to me, you know, the question of our faith in Jesus Christ is still the most important thing to all of us. So why doesn't that overcome yeah. the differences? Um so that that was that was something that I noticed. So you, and it's true the the things those the, you can't it, once you've made the decision and that's what it was like for me with Catholicism was I didn't I didn't know everything you know I no. I def- definitely didn't practice yet so you're already much ahead of me in that sense um, but just to make the choice mm-hmm. the effort and to make and just think okay I might not know everything but I'm going to make the jump yeah was actually what for me later confirmed that it was the right choice, you know? And, and that's, that's something that I tell people who struggle. They're like, okay, well, you know, I don't know if I'm ready for that. It's almost like, well, you often hear people say, I'm not ready for children, or I don't know if I'm ready yeah, for that. It's yeah. like, yeah, you're, you're yeah, already- my daughter, my sister said, I'm going to have kids in five years. Hmm. I'm going to have kids in five years. I'm going to have kids in five years. I'm pregnant. Mm. <laughs> that's how it went yeah. right she yeah. wasn't ready she wasn't ready she wasn't ready and then she's pregnant yeah and then it's just there and then you you're ready then you're ready then you're just ready and yeah that's sort of what i had with the, well you know i i haven't had the the fortune yet of having kids because i don't have a partner but um with the catholic church that was sort of how it felt it was like yeah, yeah just right. just do it you know yeah, just right, go right, right. and then yeah, yeah and five, I was years, happy five, years, five years i'm here <laughs> and now i'm here yeah now i'm here and now you're gonna put your you're yeah. gonna put you're gonna Go to work, do it, really, you know, and, and commit. And yeah, that's really... And then when, and what else do you want anyway? Yeah. You know, like, do you want to have a, a good... I have a good relationship with my family. I have a good relationship with my friends. Mm. You know, I have, a, I have a good relationship with my conscience. Oh, then you're Most times, so blessed. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it, but it's a daily practice. Yeah. So every day I sin. Every day I have a problem that I have to admit to and deal with. But I'm also grateful for those problems because I realize now that they're challenges that are sent to mm. me to remind me and to try to bring me closer to my, for my relationship with the truth. But, uh, but it's constant. Yeah. And I'm thankful for those because it reminds me, oh, yeah, uh, go, f- you know, I'm here. No, I should be here. Mm. I have to be here. Otherwise, I can't hear the truth. Right, because if you're too high on your ego, you don't hear the truth. You have to get down, yeah, lower. Absolutely, and I understand what you said about the travel too, because you will need to sit down and yeah, really just you know, yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's uh, it's been very busy. Yeah, well, I mean, 
doing doing God's work, both of you, though. But I mean, it's uh, so important. Yeah, it's so been, it's been, been super busy, but that that's okay. That's okay because uh, the um, the experiences that we've had are good, mm. and so we know. It, like George, as long as this is still fun, we'll continue to do it. Yeah. If it's not fun, we go home again. Yeah, yeah, and you touch so many people's hearts and minds. I mean, also just, you know, I was there obviously in Rotterdam when I heard you both speak and, and, and both in your story and in, in Jordan's story, just the, really, there, you know, there's this whole hole of people sitting there, thousands of people who probably never in their life hear a reference to God. Mm. Never. Mm -hmm. You know, and then somebody standing there, like your husband, who they then, you know, they appreciate maybe because of other things that they've seen of work of his that they read or, you know, that has been important in their lives to see someone they respect that much mm -hmm. say, Hey, look at this, you know, that's important. Or, or even quote a Bible verse, you know, I yeah. was, I was sitting there thinking, this is so important. Yeah. This is so yeah. good. Well, and people are there and they're attending, you know, when I come out on stage, uh, David Carter comes out first and plays guitar for s yeah. 20 minutes, which is really Great. good because it helps Jordan to have time to think mm. and also just to meditate and to get ready. And uh, I go out on stage and everybody's there. And all I can say is thank you for coming. I know you're here to listen to Dr. Peterson and we're very grateful for you being here because we know you're here to listen to put these ideas into action and to aim up. And mm. we all need to be aiming up now because there's a lot of nefarious things happening in the world. And if we're not aiming up, then, yeah. well, then that they will have the upper hand. And we can't allow that. No. No, because we have uh, other, we have all, all of the people we love to take care of, right? Yeah. So people that you want to protect, things that you want to pass on to new generations. And uh, that's that's something that sometimes gives me some hope is that the fact that those evil forces become so obvious now, you know, it's like you almost can't deny it anymore, right? Then mm -hmm. that might push people to, okay, then, you know, I have to I, look up. It looks like it. It looks like it's, you know, I mean, and the last time we went through Europe, mm. the theaters that we're in were smaller. They're larger now. And so people are listening and really... You know, what we're talking about is telling the truth, admitting that we're wrong, trying to move forward one step at a time. Yeah. And people are going, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. And then they do it and they notice that it makes their life better. And then their life gets better. And people come every day and tell him that their lives are better. Yeah, just how many people went came up to us at the table saying... Oh, Dr. Peterson, you changed my life. Right. I listened to your works. I, I felt so depressed, so even horrible. Even the server, right? Yeah, yeah, even the <laughs> server. Yeah, just everybody's just, and that's just so wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very happy and very blessed that I have the opportunity to meet you and oh, talk to you now. And, it was super yeah, fun. It's great, mm -hmm. really great.